Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Martin, senior investigative reporter for Public Radio, WGBH in Boston, and a former national race and culture reporter for National Public Radio. I'm today's moderator. Uh, today's program is an hour long, and so you're going to enjoy, enjoy every bit of it, I guarantee you. And it's a collaboration of the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and PRI's The World and WGBH. Last February, and some of you may have been here, uh, this panel of experts was convened at the forum to discuss race, criminal justice, and health, and to make recommendations about how to address social and health inequalities in our country. Now, more than six months after that discussion and more than a year since the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, we have brought back these experts to see what has and or, or has not changed uh, in the United States. We can say without question that one aspect of the discussion that has changed is the emphasis on black women who have died under questionable circumstances during interactions with law enforcement, uh, most notably Sandra Bland in a Texas jail cell and Rokina Ra Jones in a cell in Cleveland. Now, today's panelists, starting from my immediate right, are David Williams, professor of public health at the Harvard Chan School. We have Nancy Krieger, professor, professor of social uh, epidemiology at the Harvard Chan School. Uh, David Harris, who's managing director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard Law School. And Felton Tony, we call him Tony, Tony Earls, professor of human behavior and development emeritus, Harvard Chan School. And joining us remotely on our screen here is Jim Doyle, a healthcare lawyer and former governor and attorney general of Wisconsin. Uh, this program will, in will include a this program will include a question and answer with the in studio and online audiences, and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat discussion that's happening on the forum site right now at this very moment. Now, to help frame this, this, this conversation, this discussion, I'm going to turn to uh, Professor Williams, who, who delivered a deeply disturbing statistic during last uh, February's discussion. Now, you said, and I'm going to uh, quote you, you said, today in America, 265 black people will die prematurely, and 265 more will die tomorrow and every day for the rest of this year. Now you asked the audience to imagine a jumbo jet with 265 passengers crashing each and every day at Boston Logan Airport and the uproar that would result. So let me start by asking you, where is the uproar about social and health inequalities? That's a really important question and it gets to the heart of the issue that I think we're talking about today. Um, the deaths of, of black men in the custody of police is tragic. Um, it is not a new phenomenon in America. We've just been paying more media attention to it in the last two years. But it has been going on for more than a century. Um, so, so that's the first point. It is really not new. Number two, the, the fact that 265 black people are dying every day means that the deaths within the criminal justice sector is just a symptom and a small part of a much larger problem of the dramatic premature loss of life of so many individuals in their most productive years of life um, on such a massive scale. And, and that has been going on in this country for a long time. So at, at one level, if you ask me what has changed, not much has changed. Yes, we are giving more attention to it. Yes, there is more activism around the issues, but the fundamental drivers that produce these results across so many sectors of society are still in place. We need a number of things. We need awareness. Um, most Americans don't know that racial inequalities in health even exist. Most Americans are unaware, is what national data tells us. So we, we need uh, increased awareness. But much more importantly, your question gets at, we need to think at places like the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard University campus in general and other institutions across American society. We need to think of what can we do to build the political will so that we can have the fundamental systemic institutional changes in policy that will give us a different set of outcomes. We need to realize what we are faced with 
are the result of the successful implementation of social policy. And if we want to see a change, we need to think of what are the new policies we will put in place that will dismantle the structures that have produced this routine um, loss of life on such a massive scale for decades, um, centuries, frankly. And, and we need to find new ways to systematically unpack and dismantle those structures and put new policies based on equity and justice and human dignity in place. And the, the, the very point that you talk about, the structural uh, problems, the structural uh, problems in, that we have to basically deal with, is something that you also have been dealing with, Nancy. You've been dealing with it from the, from, from the frame of reference of an epidemiologist. Can you talk about the intersection of uh, the work you do, the data you've collected, and reflect on, on what David has just talked about in terms of the systemic, uh, 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 basically, obstacles that we face? in making these things uh, less, uh, less permanent. So what I'd like to um, comment on in response to your question is one part of structure that we have is the structure that allows us to know problems exist. Because if we have no data, then the problem gets discounted and we can't show that there's been a difference. And we were asked also to reflect on what's changed between now and then. So if the slide could come up, one thing that has changed, and this is where I think it's very important in terms of what my colleague David is saying, is that we have to shine a spotlight on what the problems are and the outcry around the lives that are being lost due to police violence has led to discussions here at the Chan School and also many other places about the extent to which we actually have structural racism in this country and that it's unresolved. And what I'd like to say is that when I, last February, I was able to present some data on the past 50-year trends in excess mortality among black versus white men ages 15 to 34, where it peaked in 1968 at about a tenfold difference, and then which is now about a threefold difference. This new website that came up in June from The Guardian, it's a UK paper, it's published in the United Kingdom. They started because we have no official police data here on deaths um, due to police because it's not something that is given up by the police departments and they're requested voluntarily but don't purport it. So it was always an unknown and you can see from the New York Times article that's cited here, the direct quote is the use of force by the police against minorities and whites alike is so poorly monitored that there is no precise accounting of how many citizens are killed, much less their ethnicity or other crucial details. The site launched on June 1st. By June 9th, it already reported 500 deaths. That meant that we were on track to having twice the number of deaths due to police in this country than was estimated by the FBI, which thought it would be 500 a year. As of September uh, 19th, when I made the slide, it was 862. This morning, it's 875. And these deaths are on par with major causes of reportable conditions in this country. For example, as of September 19th, they were, the numbers were larger than uh, uh, the numbers of cases of um, malaria, of, of the number of deaths among all persons under age 25 in the cities that the U.S. reports on live data on a weekly basis about the numbers of mortalities for people ages 1 to 25. So these are not, these are numbers that are comparable to other numbers that are routinely reported at a national level in real time. And we need these kinds of data, and they are possible because of the way public health infrastructure works. They are numbers that are possible to get so that the number of deaths are not a mystery. And when we come to the part about concrete recommendations, I will make concrete recommendations for how we can actually actually make these a notifiable condition so that all law enforcement related deaths of people who are killed by law enforcement agents and also law enforcement agents who die in the course of line of duty that these become one part of a national repository of real-time data because if we can monitor a problem we can see if progress or setbacks are made in addressing the problem and also numbers count for accountability without these numbers there is no accountability we can make that change well, one thing I'll say is that reflected in the data and uh, and, this, and the, some of the points that were made here thus far uh, are always stories. You always come across uh, extraordinary stories. And one story you'd like, I'd like to uh, talk about right now is um, illustrated in a video that we'd like to show. Traffic violations leading to encounters with police are a major issue in black communities. I don't know if anyone has ever had that problem in the audience, but it is something that is uh, clearly illustrated in places like Ferguson. We've seen in the news that sometimes traffic stops can end up with deadly outcomes. I mentioned Sandra, uh, Sandra's case in Texas a few minutes ago. And we'd like to show a clip from a documentary called Ferguson, a report from Occupy Territory. This is provided to us by Fusion Media Company. 
Uh, the entire film is available, by the way, on the PRI website and on YouTube. Um, in this clip, we, we follow an African-American man who is describing what it's like to reach the highway without getting pulled over. I'm going to repeat that. He describes what it's like to reach the highway, to get from point A to point B without being pulled over. Now, while this takes place in Ferguson, it's emblematic, emblematic of the larger problem everywhere in this country and relevant to our discussion around policing practices. So take a look at this. You just want to be able to not be so nervous, so much anxiety, being able to make it in, make it out. You know, just pay attention to your speed limit. Make sure you take it slow. Reach the highway, you reach the highway. <laughs> it's, this is just like you think for every day all over again. Like, whew, hit the highway. Take the side streets, don't right. take the back streets. They're waiting on you. Have your seatbelt bucking. Sit upright, don't have a ball cap on. No, turn, especially <laughs> backwards. If y'all don't have your music up, nothing. No hoodies. You know. No expression of yourself. I've been pulled over about three times a month for about the last year and a half, so it would be anywhere from 250 to $600 for one ticket. Okay, you get the ticket on a Monday, the fine's due on a Friday. If you use a lawyer, you can't pay payments. You have to pay it all in full. You can't pay it, you're not going to try to go in and pay a part because you know the result. You're going to be arrested. Right. So, out of the 10 tickets you got in the last three months, if you're on a fixed income, you might take care of three. Now you have seven warrants times at least $500. You owe St. Louis a lot of money. Okay. So I'm going to um, turn to uh, Jim Doyle. Uh, remotely. He's uh, on the monitor here. Uh, Jim, you're a lawyer, a former um, uh, AG and governor of a state that has had its own share of controversial police practices and shootings, including the uh, much disputed April 2014 killing of Dontre Hamilton, a mentally ill man. Uh, can you talk a bit about the legal and law enforcement dimensions at, at play here? Yes, and I would also add to that resume, I was a three-term district attorney, so I've been down in the actual courts uh, dealing with these for many, many years. So a couple of observations. One is, um, and I think uh, Professor Williams very eloquently stated this, this problem for those of us who have been dealing with it for a long time seems almost intractable. Not to say we shouldn't give up, but I can remember after Rodney King, I was attorney general, and the attorney general is responsible for law enforcement training in the state of Wisconsin. And we went through massive police training about cultural stereotyping and so on. And it went on for four or five years as a major emphasis. Uh, here we are, you know, 20 years later, and it seems that much of that has uh, gone by the wayside, been forgotten. Second observation I would really make is that it seems to me we have a pretty good criminal justice system for white people. The system always is a balance between being strict law enforcement on the one hand and yet having a charitable and open understanding on the other. And it's a tension that exists all the time. When it comes to African-American people, that sense of charity and mercy uh, is very hard to find. Not to say there aren't good people in the system that look for it, but a 14-year-old boy standing in front of a juvenile court judge, if white, with sagging pants and an attitude is seen as somebody we can reclaim. A 14-year-old boy with sagging pants and an attitude standing in front of a juvenile judge who is an African-American is seen as a menace and somebody that we really have to come down hard on. And you see that from the initial stops of police to ultimate decisions made by judges. It just seems to me a real lack of charity, a real lack of ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes. The third thing I want to mention is this, while very obviously great economic uh, sides of this, it is way beyond economics as well. It is pure race. I would guess if you asked everybody, the African member, American members of this panel, to tell us an experience you have had being stopped by the police officers driving through a neighborhood, I, all, every one of you could tell us a story that should chill most of us. I come from a mixed race family. I've had to deal with young African-American sons 
than see the dispiriting effect of what happens when they have good, good, just normal kids and they have their first interaction with a police officer and come home just, it is just such a deflating, dispiriting uh, 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 experience that almost everybody in the African-American community has gone through at some point. And yet it seems so hard for us in the, in, in the white world to be able to put ourselves in other people's shoes. So how, how the great theory and work that's been done by people on this panel, Professor Williams, Professor Earle, community policing, others have been just absolute national leaders, how this can gets converted into a criminal justice system of th tens of thousands of police officers and prosecutors and judges all answering to different bosses is a tremendous challenge that we have. I would just uh, finally say that I, I do think there is some hope. I know uh, Professor Earls will talk a little about community policing. I think an honest, long-term, true commitment to pol community policing is one very major step. But the other one I would just put a plug in as a former prosecutor is we have seen now in these recent incidents, the prosecutors step forward and make decisions. And then we all criticize uh, the decision, or well, we like the decision, depending on which way it, it, it came out. But when I came up as a prosecutor in the late 70s and 80s, we saw the DA not just as a person making individual decisions, but that the person who is at the hub of the system. Judges only hear the cases that district attorneys bring to court. Police cannot get their cases to court unless the district attorneys make decisions to bring them to court. The district attorney in recent times in America, I think, has become much more of a functionary, uh, just somebody who responds to what the police want to have happen, as opposed to being the real policymaker in the criminal justice system about deciding, are we going to go after minor offenses? What is going to be prosecuted in court? What, what are we going to get? What kind of sentences are we asking for? So I would ask, uh, again, my, one of my pitches these days is to really get back to understanding the critical role the prosecutor makes, not just in one-off decisions that get made, but in the broad, broad policy decisions about what the criminal justice system is going to focus on. I think, uh, thank you very much, Governor. Uh, I'm thinking also that something additionally to think about in this whole context are the multiple uh, roles that the DA plays, the DA structure plays in, uh, in perpetuating, uh, many feel in perpetuating a, a problem that seems interminable for, uh, uh, in terms of policing and the role of uh, black men and women in relationship to that system. The other question that we might talk about is the, the role of rationalizations. Uh, in uh, the Michael Brown uh, was, uh, uh, was robbing a store. Uh, DJ Henry was drunk. Uh, Sandra Bland was, seemed incoherent. Uh, all these rationalizations which have served to justify uh, police killings. These are other things I think you could talk about in terms of the, the systemic problems uh, that continue to, uh, to, to elongate or rather continue to keep this, uh, in the, uh, to keep this problem going. I think when, one of the things that we, to illustrate this uh, again, I think we might turn to a video. Uh, this is the, um, the second part of this video, folks. So one of the points we want to address uh, today is the need for thriving neighborhoods and environments and what happens if they're left to degrade. Uh, you've all, I'm sure some of you have uh, driven through what we call bad neighborhoods and so on and so forth. But let's talk about the provenance of that. Uh, and so we're going to turn again to the documentary uh, where we are uh, taken through the neighborhood of Ferguson at night to understand, to tr at least to try to understand its decline. Why? At one point, it was almost 200 houses on this street. And when you go over here, it looks like any of the best parts of Iraq you'll find. It's every bit of probably 15 houses. It was a house everywhere you see open land that when I was little, this parking lot was houses. All of these houses were thriving. This was the laundry mat. These were apartments. The school right here is closed down. This is how it affects the whole neighborhood. Every school on my side over here is closed down. Now, if you tried to buy this, like say you want to buy two, three, you couldn't buy them from the city unless you had funds already acclimated to develop something. And that's how they keep the average Joe Blow from buying their own neighborhood back. 
you notice you don't see anything open. No businesses, no candy stores, no confectionaries, no, no nothing. And this where it's the, it's the street right here. My grandmother's mother lived in that house. Her brother owned two houses on this lot. He also owned a house right here. It just got knocked down this summer. One woman and one man raised 11 kids in this house. Working at Boeing and the post office. And this will make me get up and work hard every day. There you have it. Uh, David Harris, uh, you know, sometimes I have that same feeling whenever I go back to Detroit, where I'm from, uh, driving through the neighborhood and seeing what was and what is now. Uh, tell us uh, about what we just saw in that clip and how does your community impact your life? <clears throat> well, sure. First, first of all, I want to thank, thank you all for allowing me to be here as, as part of this. It's, it's really an honor and a, and a treat. Uh, you know, and I'll say that both clips that we've seen, I think, demonstrate something that we've been talking about for quite a while, and that is the, really the devastating effect of a, of a war on drugs that's been waged in communities of color. It, that last clip looked very much like a war zone. Uh, that first clip looked like somebody living in occupied territory. The, these are the attributes of, of communities that have been really decimated by, by as, as David said, a set of policies that our government has actually pursued. So, you know, I want to uh, begin my brief remarks by showing with a slide, uh, if we could, uh, that uh, records some remarks by uh, then Senator uh, uh, Barack Obama. This Philadelphia speech, uh, you know, underscored that in our society, uh, we continue to be defined by the structural inequalities that follow closely along racial lines, as David mentioned. Although far too many of us heralded his election, uh, that his election marked the beginning of a post-racial era, and others criticized him for not continuing to name and act on these inequalities, events of the past year have put the lie to both claims and brought us to the point of having little choice but to confront the issues by name. As Governor Doyle said, you know, that name has to do with race. President Obama has done so forcefully and eloquently on several occasions, but in the second slide I'd like to share with you, uh, we see even a more remarkable development. Not only is there growing recognition that we have not achieved anything like post-racialism, uh, but the skepticism is growing across the entire population, notably, as you'll see, among white Americans who are coming to recognize that things aren't as they ought to be. And I think Elizabeth Warren gave voice to this uh, recently in a fairly dramatic way. The recognition of ongoing problems by white Americans is only part of the story, though. The other more critical element is the continued mobilization within communities of color that have been ravaged by these decades of war and their efforts to build strong, healthy ones. There's no way this can happen from above. We have to understand. Communities affected by this devastation must play a central role in crafting the corrective and restorative policies we need. And this is exactly what's happening across the country today, despite our uh, uh, distress about it, about what's going on. And we owe a great debt to the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in this respect, uh, not only for keeping our attention focused on uh, police practices that negate black bodies, but also on the need to find ways to use that spotlight to illuminate the pathway to change. We've seen a growing recognition of the need to dismantle mass incarceration. In fact, it seems like every, every week we have a love fest of the left and the right uh, proclaiming the need to do this. Uh, there are legislative proposals across the country seeking to eliminate, eliminate mandatory minimums and the punitive approaches that we've used uh, over, to which we've become addicted over the last few years. These efforts are necessary but not sufficient. Time will tell whether something like the Ferguson Commission, which included active protesters and claims to have engaged 2,000 people and generated some 200 recommendations, will be a successful example. But in <laughs> cities across the country, there are organizations arising to confront things like the effects of trauma on entire communities. Many of these efforts are little known and plug along with a few resources. There are others that are growing and giving voice across the country. Organizations like Mothers for Justice and Equality here in Boston, 
organizations such as Families as for Justice as Healing, also headquartered here. Both of these organizations have created national efforts to bring critical voices of women to the policy table. There are individuals like Lily Estes, a public housing resident in Richmond, Virginia, whose son was murdered by, someone, by, her neighbor, by a neighbor she sees every day. Lily is running for mayor of Richmond on a platform of community justice that seeks to infuse the political discourse with an honest look at racial and economic injustice. In February, I mentioned the need for a Marshall Plan to rebuild, and we believe these are examples of just how such a plan could and must work. This is not about some huge infusion of funds, although certainly funds are necessary, but about the reallocation of resources consistent with the real needs and proven policies. It is about government by the governed. It is about government of the people. David, thank you. Um, Tony Earls, uh, you've been for a long time researching community policing um, and its, uh, its efficaciousness or lack of, and you're also these days focused on um, mass incarceration, what Michelle Alexander, the legal scholar, calls the new Jim Crow. Can you talk about your research and its relationship to uh, this discussion? Well, th let me just say, first of all, that I'm, as David and the panel, uh, is pleased that we're having this discussion again at the School of Public Health. Uh, since February, not much has happened. Uh, as a researcher, I don't see some of the recommendations that we talked about um, unfolding or being taken seriously. And so I think the fact that we are at it again is extremely important. Uh, community policing, that the research I have done in Chicago and other places indicates that police have too much power. Uh, the, they fill a gap to some extent in the way neighborhoods are organized informally to address the supervision of children, the, the uh, concern about drugs and housing policy and this sort of thing. And so uh, a lot of the change that needs to happen is change that comes from the bottom up, not from the top down. Uh, and until we have a systematic way of building strengths in communities, I don't think we're going to get there. So uh, I'm mildly depressed since February because I don't see our nation undergoing systematic, systemic change. But let me uh, bring up the issue of mass incarceration as, as David did, just to say that this is another source of worry that, that, has, that I've been focused on in the last six months. Because we, between 1980 and 2000, 2005, 2010, the incarceration rate increased by four times. Uh, it went from 500,000 to 2.2 million people. Uh, a lot of those men and women, mostly men, mostly black men, 50%, 55% are African American, are re-entering citizens to the same communities that sent them or were involved in the, their behavior and their criminality that got them <clears throat> in prison in the first place. And so the major question is whether or not they can re-entry, they can re-enter society successfully or not. They have a debt to the families, they have debts to uh, the courts in many cases, they uh, have lost citizenship rights in some cases. Um, and so we need to know much more about the supports and the guidance that uh, these millions of men returning to communities will have over the next six months because they, they're another threat to the, the video clip that you showed about Ferguson, you know, the housing demolition and so forth, that we have demolished lives re-entering communities. And this is extremely important to, uh, to research seriously, to have good data about, and to work with uh, agencies collaboratively to solve the problem. I've always insisted that public health alone or public safety alone is not sufficient. So in the research that my colleagues do, we always insist that the Justice Department and the NIH, for example, collaborate so that the results 
the methods and the results are one that is shared, and the possibilities of combining housing, public health, and public safety in common strategies works. We're not working at odds with each other. Now, the final comment I have to make is that, you know, we need to know something about uh, some initiatives that we're taking, like public housing, uh, renovate, public housing reorganization, the use of vouchers, and that sort of thing. Because some of the evidence that came from the Moving to Opportunity studies show that this was successful in increasing the health status of people, but not helpful in terms of economic sufficiency. Uh, we need to know what's happening in promise zones. I mean, this is a major creation of the Obama administration, but where are the scientists studying whether or not these communities are stronger? Not just the educational outcomes, but the supervision outcomes, the supervision of young people. Uh, so I'd like to see much more systematic research done with policy relevance, but good methods and the generation of good valid data. And I think we have the, the presidents are established to, to achieve that. Well, that's a good jumping off point because, I mean, the question that anyone would have at the end of a forum like this and certainly of uh, the continuation of the discussion in February is what is to be done? Uh, what can one do? You're talking about something very concrete here. And let me just remind folks of the um, conversation that, was, that took place in February. Uh, this is a, essentially a continuation of that conversation. And we thought we might start with some recommendations made then and, and go, go from there. Tony, you just mentioned just a second ago uh, a very concrete um, uh, suggestion, something that might be done. What we're hearing in the, um, in the public uh, sphere largely is about body cameras. But I'm sure, of course, you, uh, the, you folks are talking about something way beyond that, something far more comprehensive. And again, that, that's directed structurally at the structure of racism and the structure of policing and so on and so forth. Tony, you said then in February that we need to cultivate a sense of society that gives people of color full membership, influence, and authority. David Williams, you said don't be indifferent to human suffering. Nancy, you said we need concrete policy change to have every municipality convening locally, uh, or rather convening local democratically elected truth commissions that are funded and empowered to hold hearings about police brutality and the social conditions that underlie this corrosive violence. <coughs> Governor Jim Doyle, you said encourage and support the good work done by church groups and other nonprofits to help engage youth. And David Harris, you pointed out we need a comprehensive, coherent, strategic focus on getting resources into our communities that will make us succeed. Uh, please expand from there. Let's we'll start with you, David. So let, let me go to David Harris's notion of the Marshall Plan because I, it's actually a terminology I have used to David. If we Davids, we are on the same page, uh, <laughs> intellectually, right. intellectually. But you know, we, we can ask, I mean, as I'm borrowing from all of my colleagues today, Nancy Krieger um, eloquently um, asked a question in, in a paper some years ago that we, we talk about the complex web of causation, but what's a spider? That's, that's spinning the web, and we need to identify those spiders. And, and one of those spiders that I think we fundamentally need to address in the United States that we, we seldom ever talk about is residential segregation by race uh, in this country. Uh, John Sell, a historian at Duke University, wrote a book about the origins of segregation um, in the United States and South Africa and argued that residential segregation by race was one of the single most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the United States. Because it's beneath the radar screen of most persons, but it has such pervasive effects on health and, and, and creating social inequality. And many observers of American society, from Myrtle to the Kerner Commission to uh, sociologist Massey and Denton have s talked about the centrality of residential segregation in shaping these outcomes. Let me illustrate just how powerful it is by drawing on a researcher by Harvard economist David Cutler, um, researcher team that, that they did looking at a national sample of African Americans and whites. And they estimated, using fancy econometric models that I cannot even fully describe, <laughs> they estimated that if you could eliminate residential segregation in the, United, in the United States, you would completely erase black-white differences in income, education, and unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhoods by two-thirds, single motherhood by two-thirds. All of that driven by place 
and the concentration of social ills in place. So I, I completely agree that we need to think of place-based strategies. We need to think of how do we build uh, opportunity structures within places that gives everyone an equal chance. There's nothing inherently negative about living next to others of your own race. The problem of segregation uh, is the history that created these places of concentrated poverty and concentrated social ills, and in fact, higher rates of crime, and then it becomes a vicious cycle of reinforcing in the minds of Americans the stereotypes that they, they behold about race. So we, we have to address place and, and make a commitment uh, and make a commitment and an investment. I actually think we need a major investment in, in kind of disadvantaged neighborhoods, irrespective of race in this country, to improve opportunities for American children. I have to assume you're talking about city by city as opposed to federal legislation that might uh, make some of that happen, given the stalemate in Washington. We need work at every level. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there are examples of um, uh, purpose-built communities. East Lake Atlanta was the first one. It's an example of a very disadvantaged community, but community leaders came together with wealthy philanthropists and they decided instead of trying to address each of the challenges and the social challenges one at a time, why don't we try to fix all of them together? And the results 20 years later have been remarkable. They have built a, a community, um, a mixed income community, 70% of the students going to the local school still uh, 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 eligible for federal school lunch, so there's still a lot of poor um, uh, uh, kids in the community on the one hand, but the unemployment rate or the employment rate among able adults have, has gone from 15% to 70%. Crime has declined by 95%. 5% of kids were at grade level, 95% of kids are at grade level. It's an example of we, we know what it will take to transform communities. The question is, are we willing to make the commitment uh, to do it. And that's why I go back to the need for awareness, but then political will so that we can make the changes that would, would give individuals a better chance. Thank you. Nancy Krieger, uh, evidence-based interventions such as this, uh, uh, what, what are you seeing on Arise? What would you suggest? What is to be done? So I'm mindful that we're having this panel here at the School of Public Health, and I'm mindful of what the responsibilities are of public health agencies and we in public health. Part of it is a reframing of this problem of the police violence, or it's a public health issue in relation to not of who is harmed, the communities that are harmed, what has happened when there has been impunity leading to civil unrest, when there's then further destruction of neighborhoods that are already in a bad shape, what happens to communities, what happens to the people's lives by virtue of also the issues that have been discussed here around mass incarceration. So there's a whole public health response which is geared towards prevention, which involves rehabilitation has been discussed, which is not just punitive. But again, public health also is about holding people accountable. And we don't have the data now to do that. And if you need to have the data at the local level in real time in order to do that. So that's where I come back. And it may seem like a very small data-oriented point, except that these are the kinds of data that allow us to understand where problems are. They're the data we've needed to deal with the HIV AIDS epidemic. They're the data that we need to deal with cervical cancer. They're the data that we need to do with heart disease mortality. They're the data to understand what the mortality is that's due to this kind of violence, as well well as also the injuries and morbidity. And what we can do in public health, which has not yet been done, but I've been researching this and it is possible to do, is to make any kind of law enforcement related mortality, again, whether of people killed by the police or law enforcement officials who are killed in the line of duty, to make that a reportable condition. That means that it is reported in real time by any public health medical person who is, engages with such a case. It can be depending on the way that the state laws are done. This is done state by state. This is really important because it is something that state activists can call for, can work with public health agencies, can also work with police departments who actually want to understand better. But the reporting does not depend on the police, does not depend on the criminal justice, it depends on public health people reporting the incidents. And for example, here in the state of Massachusetts, it is possible for people that are looking at occupational health fatalities not to just have to see the case, they can see news of a report in the media. And that becomes very important. That can trigger an investigation. When you consider the fact that a site exists now, like the Guardians, the Counted, that allows us to know every day in real time who is dying, it gives a basis for getting these kinds of data to understand the problem and then to have further greater 
possibilities of public response. Because if it's hidden and we don't know and we can't count, we won't have the accountability. David's already mentioned the fact that the extent of health inequities in this country by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic position is way under, unknown compared to what it should be. Many people think that it's not that big a problem. It actually is for almost any health outcome that you look at. The kinds of issues that are being discussed now about residential or racial segregation need to be combined with an awareness of what is happening with economic residential segregation and that you're having an increasing problem being in cities, including here in Boston, of the proverbial hollowing out of the middle as you get increasing concentrations of the wealthy and the poor. That needs to be documented. If it's not documented, you can't change it. And yes, this is a long-standing problem. There was a federal commission that was put together in 1929 under the Hoover administration because of unrest that grew out of different kinds of riots in response to what happened with police violence. There was a 1933 huge report in New York City that was published that was akin to what's come out of Kerner Commission and Ferguson. What's different is that the Ferguson report, unlike the New York City report back in the 1930s, actually got published. The one in the New York in the 1930s got leaked to the press because the, governor, the uh, mayor at that time did not let it see the light of day. If it sees the light of day, and that hearing, that New York City hearing, had people from throughout the community in Harlem being brought together to talk. My colleague, Dr. Mary Bassett, who will be coming here soon to school at the end of October, who's the health commissioner of New York City, has vehemently said and forcefully said Black Lives Matter is a crucial issue for us in public health and medicine because we're talking about the integrity of people's lives and their bodies. That's our business. Nancy, thank you very much. Uh, one of the questions uh, that I'd like to talk to, um, ask Jim Doyle is about, we talked about training of uh, law enforcement to uh, increase sensitivity and reduce, um, reduce racism. Uh, and isn't it something, aren't there other steps that have to be taken? It's not just a question of police training. Aren't we talking about steps every, um, uh, all along the way from, the, from, the, from arrest and reasons for arrest to the DA system, to mass incarceration, which I'll talk to our other panelists about shortly. What other steps have to be taken in the context of seeing this uh, in a more holistic manner as a public health uh, uh, issue, as a public health phenomenon? Well, I see the world very politically as my life has, uh, you know, as the, the positions I've held and the campaigns I've been through. and. Um, I love all the colleagues on this panel, but I often get a sense when I that this discussion goes on among people who have very like minds and and similar uh, goals. And to me, the real issue is how do you turn that as uh, into some kind of political movement? And that can be that we could have forums for the next uh, two years on that, but. How did we have the great breakthrough in the 1960s? Legally, most of the, the one time in my lifetime that we've seen a major change in the criminal justice system was the result of a series of Supreme Court decisions in the first half of the 1960s that did away with a great number of police abuses, basically beating confessions out of people and other things. It didn't make the world perfect, but there really was truly systemic change in law enforcement during that period of time. We saw another systemic change happen after the crack cocaine uh, uh, epidemics of the late 80s and 90s that we've talked about here today that went the other direction. Much tougher sentences, massive incarceration. How do you come to a point where you can make politically one of those changes? And it is very difficult. Let me give you two very specific examples. Uh, as governor, uh, I, we passed and I signed into law a bill that would have required police officers to uh, document every traffic stop they make based on the race of the person they've stopped. Because there's so many stops that happen that find themselves into no kind of database at all and no understanding, you know, they're pulling somebody over, rousting the car, looking around saying, sorry, see you later, or not even saying sorry, just saying, see you later. That was the one of the first bills after I left office, a new party came in both in the governor's office and the legislature. One of the first bills passed was to do away with that, to show you the kind of resistance. One of the most interesting political issues to me is the same group of people that are saying, let's test students every time they turn around because we need all this data. When it comes to having the data about police behavior, suddenly is, no, that's going to change the way police officers do the job. We can't do that, and so on. 
So uh, it, there's a, obviously a, a political agenda and not uh, consistent uh, consistency on that. The second, to go to uh, Dr. Earl's point, is we passed a provision that allowed for the um, earned release of people in our prisons serving less than five years of time on nonviolent offenses. To give Wisconsin as an example, I'm sure this number would apply nationwide. We have about 21,000 people in our prisons. If you just had people that are doing four years in prison do two and a half years in prison, we would reduce our prison population by, uh, by about, to about 18,000, by about 15% just by bringing a four-year sentence to a two-and-a-half-year sentence. Can anybody tell me that a two-and-a-half-year sentence in the four years is gonna make any difference in the public safety or the rehabilitation of that person? No, it was strictly nonviolent offenders doing less than five years. That was one of the first laws repealed as soon as the new party came into office. So I only say this to say that the work that's being done by, by the great leaders that are on this panel is so important to continuing to build the, the basis for this. But what comes along every now and then is a political moment in time when real change can happen. And I think the question we don't quite know is, are we moving into that time? Some of the data that Professor Harris uh, provided suggested that maybe with white attitudes changing, we might be moving into that different era of time but I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years we saw that chart again and we saw the white attitudes going right back to where they had been. But it seems to me data on police, clearly the visualization of these incidents that have happened in a political way have had enormous effect. And that's why I do think body cameras is an actual systemic kind of approach to this as we reveal both by the numbers and statistics and by the visual evidence exactly what is going on out there. What, what what about that, uh, uh, David? Uh, the uh, this this whole this notion of a watershed period in our in our country, a moment where some of these things could be made possible. Are we at that point? Some might have thought that that could have happened under uh, Attorney General Holder, uh, with the uh, de-emphasis on uh, on the war on drugs uh, starting to to take shape. Uh, can that happen? Is that happening? Uh, do you see a watershed moment, an opportunity for, uh, for these things to advance? <clears throat> so much to say in so little time. Uh, uh, y yes, but I, I, would, I, would, I would caution. I, I think we are at a critical time. I think uh, the governor is right. <clears throat> we do have to worry about what happens over the next couple of years. And the, the, the bad news, good news is that these things are going to keep happening. These deaths are going to keep happening. So, I, and that's one of the things I think that's starting to, to really sink in. Uh, so I don't worry necessarily that the moment that's caused by these uh, murders, uh, these police actions are going to disappear. Uh, but I, I come back, to me, I continue to think that the most important element has to do with activism. And this is a different side of the political coin, Governor, but I think it's an important one. I think we're at a point in time when people living in communities that have been under the heel of these policies are starting to mobilize and organize and start to make demands for accountability for the data. There are examples I can give of, of how to do that. There's a, there's a thing, as you know, <clears throat> Title VI of the Fair Housing requires that any, uh, any recipient of federal funds be able to demonstrate uh, that those funds are being used in a non-discriminatory way. Simple, simple action by any community is to ask a police department for, for, for the data on in any piece of its policing process. If that department has federal funds and has in fact not collected those data, that can be used to trigger a compliance review that can in fact um, continue to mobilize people and keep people on the street. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna say a couple of things very quickly. Uh, I think we also have to be cautious about all kinds of stereotypes. And I think, you know, Tony's right, you know, this kind of question about MTO, moving to opportunity, how, whether it's been successful or not. And as David says, we need to talk about residential segregation. But I'm going to tell you, we are, and as David suggested, we're not going to move our way out of poverty. Okay? So we do know a little bit about what's happening. We do know that as, as the suburbs are opened up to people of color, poverty follows them. 
poverty does moving to one place doesn't cure poverty. So I think, uh, uh, piggybacking on David's comment, I think it's really critical that we think about what makes for a vital, healthy, uh, comfortable community that we would want to live in. And we need to put the resources into making all of our communities that way and not think that you have to move from one place to another in order to access opportunity. Uh, and so, the, the, so I'll stop, I think, because we need to move on. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony, where is this nexus? Uh, where well, I just want to say two things. I mean, one is that David's comments, very cogent comments about community mobilization and activism, is measurable. Uh, and be responsible about this. We need to monitor the mothers, you know, for justice and equality. We need to monitor what impact they have on changing informally the communities in which they're working. That, those bits of data are important as police brutality data are, from my point of view. Uh, so knowing where you are as a community is something that we can measure and we should be, it should be part of the public policy to do so. The second thing is that really knocks me over and captures me and I keep rechecking it. But the recidivism rate among returning citizens, notice I use the word citizens, is 70%. And so what it means is that these men and women uh, come back to their families and communities for six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, and 70% of them are back in prison again. We need to unravel that. We need to understand that, and we need to design interventions that support the recovery and the reentry of these important citizens in our democracy. That's really fundamental. I don't think we're going to get there unless we have a way of embracing these young, mostly young African-American men as valuable assets to their families and communities. And that's what rehabilitation has to establish. And it won't be criminal justice by itself, I can tell you that. Briefly, what are those interventions? Well, I mean, the interventions are ones that David and David talked about. I mean, we have models. I mean, my, you know, I am fascinated with the Harvard, the, with the Harlem Children's Zone. And then there's lots of questions I have about what's going on there. I mean, the focus is on education, but are the spillover effects into making communities stronger? And do people know it? Do they measure it? I mean, these are the things that really concern me. Thank you, our distinguished panel. Thank you very much. We'd like to turn at this point to get some questions from um, online. Lisa, you, you have some, uh, and then from a couple from the audience if we can. Right, and I just want to be sensitive because we have a large panel and there's a lot to say. So we have a very active chat online and I encourage everyone to go on because I'm just going to take one question from that and then we can take one from our studio just because we are running out of time. Um, so here's a question from Steve Seawall. What roles can and should a city's print and electronic media play in informing and empowering citizens and governments to address youth violence in all of its causes and manifestations from the ground up at the neighborhood, area, citywide, and even national levels? Please. I think the answer is embedded in the question. That <laughs> there is really an enormous opportunity uh, for the media to raise awareness, for the media to tell the stories in a way that that captures the reality of the situation for the American public, and and that can that's part of what we need um, in terms of changing political will. So, can I, so just to piggyback on that, I mean, I think and I think the governor alluded to it. I think that so much of our th public thinking has to do with this notion of young black boys as super predators. It's a term that really defined uh, law enforcement for many, many years. And I think the press plays a critical role uh, in debunking that notion and, 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 and trying to help us get above and beyond the idea that every young black man in a hoodie is dangerous. And I, I think that's, that there's a critical role in changing the language and the way we think and talk about uh, you know, there's research that shows that, that for instance, police see uh, young, young black men as older than they are, right? I mean, and, and, and there are consequences to that. And a lot of that has to do with the way they're portrayed in the media. So. And I would just <coughs> add that clearly in this case, here we have a UK newspaper, The Guardian, that has been the most comprehensive in tracking daily who is being killed by the police. 
but the Washington Post has a, has a similar project. It's a little less comprehensive. It looks only at shootings by firearm. It does not include taser. It does not include struck by. It does not include death by being hit by a vehicle, for example. But these come from looking at media, combining its expertise in searching all the different social media, all the different feeds, where their expertise is as journalists to find the story and to report it. And to have local, this gets back to why we need local news. This is part of local news because this is what shapes the awareness of people of the conditions in their communities. And to have these stories embedded in the context of people's lives, all the lives involved, not just sensational crime stories, but stories of what the power relationships are, what the impoverishment is, what the issues are of assaults on dignity, all of that can, can and be reported. We can see some of the kinds of changes that happen with regard to, for example, in a different way but related, reporting on immigration in this country. Were immigrants just going to be those people somehow swarming the borders, or do we start to find the stories of who the immigrants actually are, what they're fleeing from, what they're coming to? Look at the change of what's happening in Europe right now with regard to the immigration crisis that is occurring there. What's the role and responsibility of media in humanizing, making stories real? Because we in public health can generate data and we can generate the population data, but we need to have it accompanied by the individual stories that give insight. It's not either and, it's both. All right, um, let's see, who has a question, uh, please? Chandra Kapasi, been 40 years that I graduated from the school this year. And uh, um, this topic has been um, deep in my heart. And only two weeks back, I met with some of the faculty uh, by, uh, helped by Julia Burke here. And we were talking about it. And I'm so happy that I got to hear all the big authorities here on this topic. And uh, my question uh, or suggestion is that uh, you know the police abuse is not only a human right matter, but it's a matter of, of, of course, public health concern. And we have enough data to prove that. As you all know, you all have done so much research and everything. I'm interested that if you all would like to maybe open a center, we need to tackle this problem badly. I'm looking for like consent, cooperation, and encouragement from the school on this project and from all of you. The question is that how can we do it? Okay, please. Thank I, you, I would want to say a big thank you to the students at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health who has kept the feet of this institution to the fire on this topic. And, and I think that the fact that we are having this conversation is really testimony not to our expertise on the panel, but to what the students have done. And we need more of that. What we need to see is the leadership of Harvard University uh, convene the leaders of all the schools and use all of the intellectual capital that Harvard has to come together and make a systematic impact to address this problem that certainly will be a model for the United States and could have global impact. So could I shoot my, my final comment was going to be just this, <clears throat> that there exists on the university, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly, there exists on the university a Harvard Interfaculty Partnership on Crime and Justice. Did you know? Did anybody know? It includes representatives from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, the Harvard Kennedy School, the Harvard Business School, the Harvard Law School, the Harvard Medical School, and the Harvard School of Public Health. It exists at this point in name only, and I, and I call upon the university to make this real. All right? And this is a vehicle, and, and this is a way in which this university can model for the world how these issues cut across sectors, and how we as a university can work collectively and not competitively uh, to address these issues. There you have it. Um, <laughs> uh, that is uh, that's something I didn't know, but we know it now. Uh, <laughs> uh, a brief takeaway, all of you, of each of you on, from this discussion, something that we could disseminate to policymakers and those who influence policy. Please, starting with you, David. Each of us has a voice. Each of us has an influence. We need to use it as a positive force in this world. Nancy? We have to be aware of the history that we come from. It's a long-standing problem, these problems of social injustice in our country. But so too, again, the arc does bend if we bend it to equity. And we can do that. 
and we have to understand what are the particular roles that we each play within the sectors of society and with which we work. There is work to be done clearly in criminal justice. There's work to be done in economic development. But there's work to be done as well in public health and understanding the corrosive impact of racism on people's health, including but not only in relation to police violence. And to make the data available, find it, make it good, so that we actually have accountability and can show change. Uh, <clears throat> I think we have to make sure that we are open to and aware of uh, the fact that voices for too long have been systematically excluded from our public policy discourse. And we have to find ways as well to make sure that young people uh, are engaged in these conversations uh, and, uh, and, uh, I'll leave it, and that we encourage the kinds of mobilizations that we're seeing and uh, give, uh, give uh, not, not guidance, but can help supply data and information to those efforts. Believe it or not, we live in a rational democracy. And we need science, we need data, we need uh, proven intervention methods to improve our democracy. We have some of those, but we need a lot more, and we depend on students and faculty to give leadership to that. And so I'm really hoping that this inter-faculty initiative catches fire. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Tony, David, Nancy, David, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Oh, I'm sorry, Governor Doyle, my apologies. <laughs> On the monitor, Governor, thank you. I, I know you're out there, believe me. I can see you. I can see you. This uh, concludes our, um, our conversation, but the conversation at the same time continues online. You're, uh, and I ask you to uh, head to the uh, forum website, forum hsph.org. No doubt you're, those of you who uh, have friends out there you'd like to get that information to, you can tell them to take a look, because next week we have another interesting panel discussion. And this is on the European refugee and migrant crisis, which uh, Nancy raised in our conversation here today, another important topic. Again, my, our panelists, thank you very much. Our audience, thank you very much. And uh, for the uh, Chan Network, thank you very much.